Um, open with our PowerPoint. So great. Welcome everyone to the final program in the Future of Dispute Resolution webinar series. My name is Janet Gilman and it's my honor to be convening the last of three programs in this series hosted by the Lyra Dispute Resolution Interest Section. The series began in February with programs focused on diversifying and developing new talent within our field. It included a roundtable of professional organizations. And then in March, we focused on the future of employment and labor arbitration. And today we turn our attention to the future of labor and employment mediation. And we'll have two sessions focused on different aspects of mediation's future this morning, as well as the future of organizational ombuds in the final hour of today's program. So if you attended an earlier session, thanks for returning. And if you're here for the first time, we welcome you. All of the sessions have been recorded and are available on the Lyra website. So before we get into it, we've got a few preliminaries. Uh, first, want to mention that this series is dedicated to David Lipsky, Professor and Dean Emeritus of Cornell University's ILR School, also past president of National Lyra, and friend, colleague, and men mentor to countless students, scholars, and professionals within the field of labor and employment relations, including many in the audience today. Professor Lipsky's work has and continues to shape and advance our uh, understanding of negotiation and conflict resolution. And we wanted to recognize and thank him for his exceptional contributions to our field through this dedication. The series also honors the memory of a dear friend to many, Marsha Greenbaum, arbitrator from the Boston area who sadly passed away earlier this year. Marsha was uh, also a leader and educator in the field of dispute resolution. Notably, she served as president of the Society of Professionals in Dispute Resolution, or SPIDER, it was referred to. And she also received the Lyra uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Marsha, we know, would have loved this series and would have been here with us today, no doubt. Uh, she was a great friend and mentor to many, and we recognize and remember her also today. So let's talk a little bit about the structure. Today's panels are designed to be conversational. We've built in opportunities for audience participation. Uh, we can't accommodate a um, live Q&A format, but we will engage you through the use of polls and by addressing as many of your questions as we can through, through, through the chat mechanism. Uh, throughout and, and certainly at the end of the session. So I'm, I'm joined by my co-moderator, Tom Melanson today, who I'll introduce in a minute, but he's going to be monitoring the chat box for your questions. So we ask that you direct your questions to Tom um, and he's going to collate and refer questions to the panelists. We probably can't get to all of them, but we, we're going to try. Uh, we do ask that you stay muted throughout the program just so that we can focus and hear the panelists. Um, this is a reminder that the session will be recorded. Um, and we're going to end on time. Nobody believes the mediator when they say that, but we are <laughs> going to we are going to end on time. And the next session will begin after a 15 minute break um, at 1015 on the West Coast and 115 on the East Coast and where, whatever your time zone is. The panelists have agreed to stick around for 15 minutes after the session. And, and uh, they, I'll talk about this at the end, but there are going to be breakout rooms. Um, where you can go and have further conversation with them if you'd like. So with that as sort of a stage setting, I want to turn to introductions. We truly struck gold with this panel of experts today uh, here to talk about the future of mediation with focus on the ways in which technology is transforming mediation practice and the profession. The title is Beyond Zoom because we really wanted to convey that this isn't just another uh, session about conducting online mediation. In this session, we're contemplating what is on the horizon, really looking out 10 to 15 years. The panelists, of course, are informed by today's experiences, but they will draw on um, and extrapolate from innovations and de developments from a broad array of disciplines, including uh, computer science, negotiation, dispute resolution, 
communications and law. So I'm your moderator today. I'm Janet Gilman. I'm the state conciliator with the Oregon Employment Relations Board. And as I said, I'm uh, happy to be joined by my friend and colleague in Seattle, Tom Melanson, who is a strategy officer for FMCS. Tom and I met and continue to work together through Lyra. So it's a great place to have these professional possibilities. Uh, Tom and I both sit on the Lyra dispute resolution interest section and we're practice leaders there. So now let's get to the stars of the show. Uh, happy to have Danielle Karn here. She conducts the mediation and arbitration practice from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Danielle provides dispute resolution services in a number of areas. Um, however, her, a significant portion of her practice is in public and private sector labor and employment dispute resolution. Uh, Danielle also teaches labor and employment law as well as mediation and arbitration at the University of Wisconsin Law School. She's the former chair of the Lyra Dispute Resolution Interest Section, and Danielle has been writing about and lecturing about the role of technology in dispute resolution long before COVID-19. In fact, she and I did a session on technology and dispute resolution at the national meeting a couple of years ago, so super happy to have her here. Um, Josh Flax is the head of the Office of Strategy and Development for the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service based in DC. Josh has extensive experience as a federal mediator and now is responsible for leading the office charged with supporting federal mediators in their use of technology and carrying out their work here in the US and abroad. Uh, FMCS certainly is at the cutting edge of technology and mediation practice and, and Josh is central to this work. So we are really a privilege to have him here today. And then lastly, uh, but not least, David Allen Larson uh, is a professor of law at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and senior fellow at the Dispute Resolution Institute. David has been involved with online dispute resolution or ODR as we'll refer to it today since 1999. And he is the system designer who helped to create the ODR platform for the New York State Unified Court System. David is a fellow for the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution and the American Bar Foundation. He's chair-elect of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, co-chair of the section's ODR standards task force, and he was a member of the ABA e-commerce and ADR task force. David has authored many legal publications and scholarly papers, but I wanted to point out that the one with the greatest number of downloads is titled Artificial Intelligence, Robots, Avatars, and the Demise of the Human Mediator. So I'm gonna let David uh, explain that one to you. If that doesn't light up the chat box, I don't know what will. Um, all right, so to get started, our panel will be discussing a variety of topics under this technology and dispute resolution umbrella, but we've asked them to organize their remarks with a couple of guiding questions in mind. One, what does their current experience tell us about or tell them about where technology may be taking the field of workplace uh, mediation again over the course of the next 10 or 15 years? And then in what ways do they see technology advancing and or impeding what is essential to effective mediation practice? Now, the, um, the question of what is essential to mediate effective mediation practice is sort of a foundational question to this discussion. And the panelists are going to be talking about what they view as essential, um, but we'd first like to pose that question to you, our audience. Is a human mediator, for example, essential in the conduct of effective mediation? And to get your involvement, uh, Tom is gonna to help us engage with some technology here this morning. So we're gonna get our cobwebs uh, shake, shaken out here um, to uh, answer this question. So, Tom? Uh, thanks, Janet. So, in the chat box is a link, and uh, this is a word cloud, and we're going to try this uh, today. And the, the question is, what single word, and it's, an, it's important that you put only a single word into the word cloud, describes an essential feature of effective workplace mediation? And in a second here, Janet, I'm going to share my screen. Sure. Uh, to show the word cloud and they're, they're starting to they're starting to populate so let me go ahead and do that and then we'll show what's going on there and we'll just wow, give this, this, is, a few this is a high tech group here they're coming in and 
I would the still way be the, like, where's the chat? Wait a minute, yeah. what? Yeah, the way the word cloud works is if there are more than one responses to a particular word, then it becomes larger. And as you can see, trust seems to be the word that is uh, empathy. We're seeing some trends here, listening, respect, humility. Uh, so we'll just give it a few more seconds here as people put in their responses and see if, it, uh, if the trends change a little bit. We're seeing some definite trends in the cloud, which I wouldn't be too surprised about, but it's always interesting to watch. Yeah. Now, will we be able to save this? Uh, yes, um, I will have, we will still have the cloud and I can, I'm sure I can just take a screenshot of it. We'll figure out how to do that. That's a, okay. a good, good idea. Yep. Okay. And I think uh, we've got a pretty good uh, start on this. I just, again, want to kind yeah. of emphasize some of what we're seeing, trust, listening, respect, empathy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are the so Danielle's going to kick things off. I would be curious to know what your thoughts are about what you're seeing there, Danielle, and just take us into your thoughts about technology. Sure, Janet. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you, uh, Lyra, for having us this morning. And thank you, Janet and Tom, in particular, for um, getting us set up for our session. Um, I know we don't, we don't have a lot of time uh, this morning, so um, I am going to, in the spirit of you know, leaving time for discussion, I'm going to jump right in and try to be um, brief. I really want to start us off um, by thinking a little uh, philosophically about our topic. Um, Lyra has asked us to consider mediation um, 10 years down the road. And to do that, um, I'd like to ask us to look first, just for a moment, about a half a century back, actually. Um, so, you know, mediation, as most of us understand, I think, was developed um, as a field first in the area of industrial relations. Um, it was used to resolve labor disputes, and it is still used um, that way today. Um, early in the field, there were some, you know, I would say very wise individuals who began to think about and write about um, and debate about uh, the question we have posed to you all this morning, which is what are the essential features of mediation? Um, and you all saw that we got some interesting um, and, and maybe some expected responses. Um, this is a debate that really began, um, I would say, in an article written by Lon Fuller in 1971. And it's wonderful, it's called Mediation, Its Forms and Functions. Um, asking uh, the question of what the mediation process in labor relations uh, really looked like. Um, in part, those questions were being asked um, over time as a way to determine whether mediators could or shouldn't be regulated. But I would say more importantly, and you know, for our purposes today, the question was whether we as practitioners um, could identify essential features of mediation um, to create a sort of cohesive um, understanding of the process, um, something that we could all agree to constituted mediation. Um, not only maybe to make us better mediators, but um, just for the simple purpose of, of um, managing expectations. Um, one of the questions that was asked in this early debate, for example, was you know, whether mediation looked more like facilitation or evaluative approaches or something kind of in between. Um, I think it's safe to say that there really was no disagreement um, as that debate evolved um, with regard to these points um, when it was focused on labor relations. And now we have mediation as a process that has you know, expanded into many different areas from um, labor and employment law disputes, for example, to um, you know, into family and commercial disputes. So the debate is arguably one that is even less settled as we progress or becomes less settled as we progress. Let me just fast forward now to um, today's topic. Um, as a panel, we have been through a number of discussions about the topic and we all have agreed on the fundamental point um, that the use of technology in mediation 
um, including remote or virtual work, as we've called it, is here to stay. Um, there appear to be enough benefits uh, to be reaped from the use of technology um, that it leads us to believe that this is not only a, you know, a pandemic phenomenon. Um, if that's true, I would suggest that we need to be deliberate in our thinking in a couple ways. One, what are the features that we find essential um, and how can technology be developed to support those particular features? Um, I would say making sure that we as practitioners and users, participants in the mediation process um, are, can make- I got my boarding pass out. I don't remember if we use it here or not. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we can make an important um, contribution by thinking about this question or by having thought about what the essential um, ingredients for mediation are. Um, and I would say that gives us an opportunity to make sure that our practice is driving the technology rather than the technology um, driving our practice, which is you know, maybe what has been happening um, to us a little in the, more in the last year than, than we would like, um, albeit I would say you know, successfully in many cases. Um, so let me just talk for a minute about the, the concept of gaze alignment. We saw that you know, communication, trust, um, empathy, terms like that featured, I, I would say pretty prominently in our, in our, um, in our word game <laughs> that we played. Um, and you know, I, I think almost everyone would agree that eye contact um, is an important part of communication, an important part of establishing empathy, um, an important part of establishing um, trust. Um, and this is, this is all part of the mediation process. Um, you know, I want people to see my eyes and I want to see their eyes for various reasons while these discussions are happening. There's a lot of important information to be gathered from um, being able to do that. When we are in person, uh, this activity can be very precise. Um, if Josh is sitting across the table from me in a conference room, I can tell whether Josh is looking at my eyes or my forehead, um, frankly. So, you know, as humans, we're able to be um, extremely precise in this area, but when we have been using technology, I would suggest that the idea of gaze alignment has been sort of lost over the last year a little bit. Because of the way technology works, we can see each other's faces clearly, but we are not um, necessarily looking um, straight at each other's eyes. So the question for us becomes whether we will accept that limitation um, because it's a part of technology now, or whether we will decide in thinking again more philosophically about the process, we will decide that something like gaze alignment is so important that we need to ask the technology and we need to demand that the technology supports something like that. Um, I have actually signed, uh, just briefly, I signed a non-disclosure agreement um, with an individual who is working um, with uh, putting various pieces of hardware together to address an issue like gaze alignment. Um, and, and if any, that, that's something that it, in terms of my conversation is, is um, in the testing phase, um, I would be happy to talk with anyone who's interested in hearing about that testing phase and putting um, any of you in, in touch with the individual who's working on that. But um, you know, as that technology is being developed, I think it's important that we're a part of the conversation. And I think it's important that we are clear as we participate in the conversation about what our objectives are. Um, and again, I think these questions take us back through um, the entire history of, of this debate. Um, let me just make one final point, then I'm going to pass it over to Josh. Um, and, and to do so, I want to reach back into one of these articles again. Um, there was an article written in 1994 by Frank Sander and, and Stephen Goldberg, which many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, called Fitting the Forum to the Fuss, a user-friendly guide to selecting ADR processes. Um, the article focuses on carefully evaluating um, each case, I would say, to determine what dispute resolution process, including mediation, but others as well, such as arbitration, would be most appropriate to support resolution in a particular case, given the objectives 
and the perceived kind of impediments to, to settlement in that case. Um, this question, I think now, that article was written in 1994 and where we find ourselves now is I would say needing to add an additional layer of consideration to the questions that were posed back in that article. Um, and, the, and the question is, you know, whether uh, the technology that is available at the time can support any particular aspect of a case or not. Um, and I think we have to be open-minded um, about answering that question, you know, as we evaluate individual cases as a um, very close colleague of mine has said more than once, you know, just because I have a hammer, um, everything is not a nail. Just because I'm a mediator, every case does not need to be mediated. And just because we have technology available um, doesn't mean it has to be applied in every case. So again, you know, what I'm urging is a kind of deliberateness um, about exploring those questions. Um, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you, Josh. I really appreciate that, Danielle. Thank you very much. And you offered me a, a perfect setup, um, you know, because uh, what I wanna just in brief talk with the group about today is what technology do we have available and what should we have available and how will we get there as, as conflict management professionals? Um, so just to give you back, to step back for a moment and give you the lay of the land, uh, pandemic obviously necessitated the move to 100% virtual service provision for federal mediation, the entire organization uh, nationwide. Uh, we are still operating under this condition. We conduct zero in-person meetings. Uh, and of course, we mostly utilize a video teleconferencing platform similar to the one uh, that we're using today uh, for this symposium. Um, so this breadth and depth of nationwide scope, you know, tens of thousands of meetings over a year of virtual only operations has given us a real perspective now to finally examine the questions of what is today, what is, what is this virtual meeting space and what should the virtual meeting space be? So the perspective I wanna offer you uh, is a picture of what the technology is today and a vision uh, in some sense of what it needs to become or at least how to ask the questions to figure out what it needs to become. So. My job here is a bit to bridge uh, Danielle's philosophical inquiry uh, and, and uh, eventually we segue to David's uh, case study, which is going to be uh, much more highly technical. So we realized a year ago, fundamentally speaking, the business of American industrial relations must get done, uh, especially during pandemic, the numerous challenges facing American workers and employers the ne negotiating of contracts, the administration of those contracts, the handling of the relationship and shop floor problems on a daily basis. All this could not wait. So FMCS service provision uh, to help these parties, help our parties, our clients and customers navigate the challenges had to continue uninterrupted if possible. Um, I realize it's a bit outside the scope of Lyra, but FMCS has other missions and the same held true. Uh, uh, nationwide uh, mission critical negotiated rulemaking facilitation, designing, implementing and running administrative dispute resolution programs in federal workplaces. All of our work couldn't wait. So we sort of instantaneously uh, transferred our in-person workflow to our computer screens, to our webcams, to our, to our PC microphones and the natural question, especially you know, since we've got 130 US federal mediators and we we're in, in touch with kind of all of their feedback, um, you know, how did it go? Uh, and the answer I'm happy to report is pretty well for the most part. Um, but uh, today I'm here not to talk about whatever, what, what the missteps were, but rather the why. why. Why are we doing this and is it going to be effective, right? So we answer the question, is this possible? Is it possible to move an entire uh, federal agency uh, nationwide service provision, um, mediation, et cetera, service for the clients? Is it possible to uh, transfer it to the virtual state? Uh, the end, you know, can we do this? Of course, we did it. Yes, we can. But how effective were we? Right? Did our mediators just simply transfer 
their business as usual approach and technique to their parties via the computer? Well, in the beginning, yeah, that's all they did. They just did exactly what they would do in person on the computer. Convene joint session virtually, put parties in private caucus virtually, shuttle diplomacy virtually, conduct uh, what we call the relationship development and training seminars we give virtually. And our parties continue to reach agreements. They continue to improve their labor management relationships. So we thought, wow, we can still hold meetings. This really works. And we didn't have time to ask the more important question, were we effective as conflict management professionals? Well, if your benchmark is we can't meet in person, but the meeting can still take place, sure, we were, we were effective. But by now, we see the virtual meeting technology has come very far. It is now ubiquitous. It mostly works just fine. Uh, cue, cue the meeting glitch right at this moment to make me eat my words. Um, but assuming it's all still working well and it's ubiquitous, the benchmark of the meeting is taking place is a pretty low bar, right? I mean, I think we can all agree on that over a year in. So what we've really learned is that the virtual format is totally different than the in-person. And to be truly effective dispute resolution conflict management professionals, the work in the virtual space requires us to improve our game fairly dramatically, mainly due to three interesting features of the virtual meeting space. Um, and I've got them, Janet, on a slide, but it's not very complex, so we can proceed without them. Number one feature is access. More people can attend more meetings. To all of you out there, this has been obvious and mostly a good thing. Uh, one example, Danielle and I have both been working on projects in Indian country with Native American tribal members virtually in situations that normally would have featured travel and great expense, making the services less frequent or less accessible and therefore uh, less effective. Um, and so that's just one example. I know that for everyone in this meeting, you, you probably got your own version of expanded access. Number two, attention span and focus. Um, and this, I just learned about a recent academic study, and I believe it was at Stanford. They measured the average distance between the computer user, your face, and your computer screen. Okay, that's about 20 inches in most cases. So every time you do a virtual meeting, like now, you're 20 inches away from all the other faces on your screen. That's a distance uh, from other people that's more normally associated with, with conflict or with courting, right? So this is a major contributor these researchers found to exhaustion from long meetings in the virtual format. And, and that's not to mention people who turn off their cameras and stop paying attention or folks who have to deal with care issues in their household during the meeting. So attention span and focus. And lastly, the constant running comparison to the in-person meeting. The mediator or other professional spends her time addressing the meeting as if it is taking place in person and making process and other moves and decisions in that context. Some of our own federal mediators, even a year into this, uh, struggle with their inability to take advantage of how different the virtual operating environment is. And there are many pros and, of course, all the cons. But those pros need to be identified, studied, explored, and exploited to help our parties and our clients produce better agreements and improved relationships. So with these three features in mind, I'm gonna distill for you what federal mediation has learned across the country, across the agency uh, for uh, best practices uh, for our meetings. Um, uh, to hopefully your benefit, some of which uh, you've certainly seen before, but here it is all in one place. And then we'll sort of ask the future questions uh, before I hand it over to David. So we wanna celebrate expanded access, but don't forget to develop a strategy for how to use it. You can reach more clients in more places than ever before. What does that mean for your practice? We have to ask the question or if many more people can pile into the meeting than ever before, some who can't even stay for the whole meeting, what are you going to do with that expanded attention and interest? And number two, 
chop down the meeting duration as much as possible, just because four to 20 people have cleared an entire day for your meeting doesn't mean the group will get a lot of work done. Usually we're starting to realize it means the opposite. Break that meeting into bite-sized 90 minute or two hour chunks and crush that half day training program into 75 minutes. And we had uh, moving on to number three, a wonderful demonstration already by my colleague, Tom Melanson, with whom I work pretty much every single day about employing very technology, uh, uh, very technology platforms where they add value. So you can check in with a poll everywhere question or a quick MS form survey with your group, uh, solicit your participants feedback with an electronic flip chart that they can access directly, utilize a virtual planning board with sticky notes. One of them that we like is called Miro to offer your participants a direct engagement. Don't just reach for a gimmick, however, you need to build a direct engagement tech platform into your strategy, into your process, and into your tactical approach. And finally, uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the virtual with a deliberate uh, a non ironic nod to Kubrick uh, in, in his uh, sort of futuristic technologist kind of a hat on with many of his films, stop thinking of the virtual as simply a remote meeting substitute for in person work recognize that the virtual is its own thing, make yourself aware of the cons, then go out there and find those pros and exploit them to the max. And just before I pass it over to David, and, and uh, thank you again, Danielle, because I want to circle it back to the philosophical question of the moment. So if we've learned so much, and uh, Janet, thank you very much, we don't need the slides um, anymore. If we've learned so much about how to maximize use of the virtual space, how will our best practices, everything we've learned, filter back to the technologists and the developers to incentivize them to create the next generation of platforms and roll them out so we can improve our virtual practices even further? That's what I want to know. More equitable access for more people? Yes, please. More flexible platforms for me to enhance my meetings? Yes, please. We're waiting uh, patiently. I'm not so sure anymore uh, because to me, it's clear the future of successful dispute resolution and conflict management practice in the virtual space is going to require us to seek some kind of a more direct connection to those technologists and developers and those future thinkers. They're trained to think in the language of marketable productions right, to the largest possible market. If I add this button over here, will the additional feature keep the users on my platform, as opposed to seeing those users leave for somebody else's platform? Will that new button attract new users? We've seen this already with features added to Microsoft Teams just in January of this year. Breakout rooms all of a sudden appear. Okay, wonderful. But that feels to me just like Zoom breakout rooms. I wanna know, and I'm ready, what's the next level of accessibility and flexibility from our video conferencing platforms? And how do we help the technologists and developers see this from our perspective as conflict management professionals rather than from the marketing department's perspective? I think that's the challenge we all face and the questions we need to answer over the coming years. Uh, and I really appreciate your time and attention, David. Janet, can I ask you to put the slides back up? So we're in a period really where we are reimagining justice. Uh, we've got a combination of things going on. Um, we have emerging and evolving technologies, uh, but in combination with that, we have a lot of social change going on, and I'm kind of here in the epicenter of it, here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the prosecution just arrested in the Derek Chauvin case. Um, Dante Wright was just shot and killed this week. So I think in one prediction I can make pretty confidently is our justice system is going to change and that um, we should be thinking about how we would like that to change. I agree with Danielle that practices should drive technology, not vice versa. But I also believe that we should think creatively about embracing the technology that's available and thinking about how we might use that technology 
to deliver justice in ways that we haven't been able to before. Um, Janet, could we go to the next slide? In the world of online dispute resolution, there's a, there's a debate going on of what, what is ODR, what is real ODR. Um, some would say, as the Resolution Systems in Institute says, that if you're using technology to supplement or replace whatever you've been done, whatever you've been doing before, that's ODR. Uh, the National Center for State Courts would say eh, that's not really ODR. Um, you're just using communication platforms doing the same old thing. Um, unless you're using something that was explicitly designed to assist parties or litigants in resolving disputes, that's that's ODR. And let's see what communication technologies you're using in combination with algorithms and blind bidding and artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. I firmly believe ODR can, can improve access to justice. There's lots of reasons why people can't participate in person. Shame, fear, no vacation time, transportation issues, child care challenges, physical intimidation by the other party, which is not a small thing. Um, disability, ODR can help with all of that, but it's not a complete panacea and we really have to be careful. Um, I'm part of a co-chair uh, of a standards task force, ODR standards task force for the ABA. We actually have the ABA uh, spring conference for the section of dispute resolution going on right now. And I'm making a presentation this afternoon about the ODR standards. And uh, I'll just give a quick plug. Um, everything's being recorded in that conference. When you're done with this conference, you may wanna go over and join the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution conference, where we're talking about a lot of things about technology, including ODR standards. Um, and I think that Janet told me that, that she's joined and I assured her that everything's been recorded. So you, you stay your full day with this program and you can go back and see uh, what we've already done in the ABA program. Um, but we do have to be careful. We have to think about confidentiality. You have to think about security. Are you just using email? Not the best thing. Um, there are uh, platforms available like Modron and uh, ADR Notable and a program called Troct that are closed systems that are much more secure when it comes to document transfer and email communications and chats. And if you're doing those kinds of things and you're just using email, I, I, I really think that you should reconsider what you're doing because I don't think that's sufficiently secure. I'm gonna give you a website that, that'll give you helpful information. It's just odr.info. If you go to that website, there are drop down menus available to you. And um, one of those drop downs gives you a list of about 100 ODR providers that you can do a little, little exploring as to whether or not there's a provider and a platform out there that might suit, suit your interests. Can we go to the next slide, please? One thing I'm concerned about with the future is that best practices right now um, say that if you're doing, if you're neutral, if you're doing mediation, what you should do is first introduce people to the platform, acquaint them with it, make them familiar um, before you start the mediation. And um, well, that's probably a good idea. But the problem is, is that um, I think mediators have always had a dirty little secret that we do all kinds of things that influence the outcome from the way we set up the room to the way we reframe issues, uh, timing, all kinds of things uh, that we do that, that actually do affect the process. And I, know, I think now with technology, that potential has been uh, increased exponentially on the kinds of things you can do. And one of my great concerns is that if you're going through the process of introducing people to technology, um, you're positioning yourself as a neutral, a person with all the answers. And now people are looking to you for the answer. Um, how do I do this? How do I do that? And then in the same breath, at some point, you're going to stop and say, by the way, I'm just a facilitator now. And I'm not going to be providing the answers. But, but I think you are the answer person. <laughs> You've been the answer person. Uh, I think that's a pretty subtle thing, but it's a very real thing. And I think that if you're going through that two-step process, you have to be very conscious of that you may be positioning yourself in a way that you don't want to be perceived. Good, good solution might be have someone else do the technology introduction part. Um, have somebody else walk through the technology that you're going to be using before you come in as a facilitator. Um, and I think that that might be a healthy way to approach that. Um, there's all kinds of technology available particularly if you're doing things asynchronously, you can, you can alter form and voice and pitch and timber. You can do so many things with technology. There's technology out there called the Emotion AI that um, will track your micro expressions, um, your tone, your timber, you know, and then, then tell you what, what 
sentiments or emotions somebody's feeling, um, which is almost a little creepy when you think about it, but it's out there and it's available. And the question is, do you wanna use it as a neutral? Is, is that something that you can use effectively or is that something that's gonna be subject to abuse? Can we have the next slide, please? I've been working with New York for four and a half years as the ABA liaison to the pilot project for o uh, online dispute resolution. We spent two and a half years doing a online credit card debt collection system. I could talk a long time about that. I wrote an article um, that uh, if you go on SSRN, the Social Science Research Network, you can read my article about my New York experience. But we did this very complicated system, all kinds of consumer protections built in. Um, in the end, some people who weren't really fully informed about the system got very upset about the possibility of putting debtors in virtual spaces with um, debt holders and did a kind of political campaign and blocked the whole thing. So a couple of lessons learned from that is that if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring in technology, be as transparent as possible, I thought we were, um, anticipate conflicts, there's gonna be resistance. Um, uh, we had to do a request for proposals. Uh, there, we didn't, New York decided not to disclose everything about the ODR platform because they thought it would taint the, the request for proposal process that people would be getting our platform too early and they could have an advantage making the request for a proposal. So they didn't release the entire platform, which I think created some confusion and some resistance. Um, and if you're bringing in something into an organization, be it with a state court system, with a company, um, with a union, uh, boy, my advice is to enlist highest levels of, of that entity from the beginning. Um, if you have that kind of support, top-down support rather than bottom-up support, I think you'll probably be a lot more successful. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna talk a little about where we are at in New York because the whole thought about this kind of a process is that it's gonna be expanded to other causes of action. And for example, I can see how um, some of these automated processes would be really good for maybe uh, wage and hour disputes. Um, I can think of a lot of ways, uh, areas in which you could use these things in employment. So uh, what our small claims uh, platform looks like is that it's a pilot project. It's just basically in Manhattan. It's only gonna be for goods and services for now. Um, there are platforms out there doing other things. The Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia, that's a good thing to look at. The Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia. They've been active for over two years. Um, they started doing condominium disputes uh, and small claims cases. They've expanded into personal injury cases, uh, which some people would say, you can't do that online, it's too complicated. But you know, they're capping them at $50,000 for now, but they're gonna expand them. So we're starting at goods and services, $10,000 or less. Um, you know, a lot of challenges because the New York court system is not fully digitized. Uh, you know, they don't accept fees. They have an end court and external vendor collecting fees. So what it means that when you are thinking about automating your process, you've got to think about a lot of things about your fee collection and you know, how you're going to integrate uh, external technologies and the platforms you're using when you're selecting a platform. You probably want to select one that's as comprehensive as possible so you don't have to use a lot of, integrate a lot of third parties into it. Um, there's no assigned court dates right now in New York. So we had to guess how long is ODR, ODR going to be. You know, we decided let's do it for two months. Um, you, if you're going to be using technology, you should think about hard and soft opt-outs. There should be some things perhaps that should not be done with technology. We're not letting domestic violence cases uh, be decided in the platform, for instance. Um, we're asking questions like, uh, do you have any physical and mental challenges um, that, again, will remain confidential. The other party can't see this. But on the soft opt-out questions, we ask the question, then we ask, would you still like to continue? And you might want to do that in your own practices. Um, do some hard, soft outs aside that I don't think these cases are appropriate. I'm not even going to consider them as eligible for my technology. Or you might want to have soft opt outs, ask the parties and let them opt. Um, we have animated videos that we use that I think are really effective for engaging the parties. Um, last slide, please. So in our process, we have blind bidding. Blind bidding is something that I think uh, really could be very very valuable in a workplace situation. Blind bidding, um, all that means is that there's gonna be a series of three rounds. It's not an unfamiliar concept. It's just that now you're gonna do with technology. Um, so there's a demand, there's an offer to see if there's an overlap. 
Uh, if, it, if there isn't, to try it again, try it a third time. There's lots of questions with blind bidding. Um, you know, how do you want to, if there is an overlap, how do you want to split it? Do you want to just split it down the middle? There's a platform out there called Smart Settle that has a, um, a pretty sophisticated blind bidding system and they've been around for a while. They're very experienced. And they, they have a system of incentives where they will reward parties for moving to the areas of settlement first. So, and, you know, they make it very clear that if you're willing to be more collaborative, you're gonna get the benefit of the split. Uh, so there's really some interesting things you can do with blind bidding, but I think blind bidding is an automated process that can be very valuable um, in the workplace situation. Um, even if you get the amount, you're gonna to have to kind of settle on the terms. Uh, in New York, we have a direct negotiation that's structured where we go through and let the parties suggest things about the number of payments, what happens in default, what's the amount of each payment. Um, if they can't reach agreement on the direct negotiation, they have an opportunity to engage in uh, direct messaging and conversation. At this point, this is pretty much all automated. There's no third party uh, involved in the process. If, however, they reach an amount or they, if they reach an amount or don't reach an amount, if they reach an amount and can't agree on all the terms, at that point, you can request a mediator. And in New York, they're using two community mediation centers, which again, created some design challenges because they're external entities they are not part of the court system. So we had to create dashboards for the, for the mediation centers. Um, but I think we, <laughs> that the, the system went live at the end of January. So uh, I think we've conquered most of our challenges. Um, I think I just hit my 12 minute limit. We're gonna have breakout rooms. Uh, I guess the one thing I wanna want you to think seriously about is that there's a digital divide that's very real and it's generational. And when I think about, and I'm sure you've seen this with your own children, that the way they use technology and the way they live in virtual environments is not gonna go away. Um, they're gonna, they're, they're doing all kinds of very personal sensitive things using technology. They're gonna to wanna to do disputes that same way. If you can't provide that service, um, no, you won't feel this in a couple of years. You're gonna feel it in five or 10 years. They're just not gonna, they're just not gonna come to you. Um, they're gonna seek out other, other venues for their dispute resolution. So I think like it or not, um, <laughs> the, the old ways of doing things, it's gonna be dwindling and it's not gonna go away overnight, but it's gonna be shrinking pretty predictably. And uh, I encourage everybody to think about how, how they can uh, kind of move their, move their practices uh, where they're adopting a little more technology. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David and Josh and Danielle. Wow, you really walked us through a, a lot to think about here from the, 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 the fundamental questions. And I, I really like the initial question posed, who's, who's in charge here, technology or us? Who's going to shape who? And I think that's an, a very important question. And one of the driving reasons we're here contemplating this today. Um, and then I like, you know, Danielle talking about this as a, you know, a deliberate process, a deliberate question, a case by case analysis, and, you know, moving into Josh really kind of talking about the application of that, um, that if you approach technology um, with a certain set of assumptions, uh, the, the technological fit may not be there. Um, so we have to be thoughtful about what we're trying to achieve, how we define effectiveness and employing the right technologies and asking for the development of the technologies that are going to meet our needs. And then of course, David walked us right into the future um, and revealed some things that maybe many of us didn't even realize uh, were underway. Um, so there's a lot of information and, and resources. And I like the philosophical base of this because we've got to be as the practitioners, ones asking the questions and driving the thinking. Um, it's a fast moving train, but we've got to keep up um, with it. So Tom, what's happening in chat? Well, uh, we haven't had a lot of questions yet generated in the chat. So I'm gonna encourage uh, the participants, there's 141 of you we have, uh, looks like about 10 minutes left. And uh, feel free to post your question in the chat. And also if you will, 
Uh, if you want the question to be answered by one of the three panelists, or you'd like all three of them to, to address it, uh, just let uh, let us know in the chat. Uh, so. And, it, and Tom, while we're waiting, can I can yeah. I sort of piggyback on something David um, said? Absolutely. And maybe maybe play devil's advocate a little bit, David. You, you know, you were talking about um, preparing parties for technology and preparing the technology um, itself, not in the ODR setting, but more in you know what Josh and I are looking at, um, preparing parties to utilize technology and the question of whether. Um, that's something that should be handed over to a third party. Um, you know, I've had a lot of opportunities to think about that in my practice. And I, I would say this is not a, a new question necessarily. Um, even before technology played a role, I, I found myself in some cases at least spending a lot of time um, preparing parties to even understand what mediation would be like, let alone mediation over Zoom. Um, so, you know, that preparation time is something that has um, always been a part of, of my process. And I actually find that engaging with parties um, um, in discussions about technology is simply an additional opportunity for me to, um, you know, to do what some have called sort of smuggling mediation, which is to um, take those procedural opportunities um, as a as a chance to gather information about you know how parties are going to participate, what their mindsets are, um, with respect to the particular dispute, and you know participating in mediation. So, uh, one of the things I've done in my practice is I put together written guides. I also do a lot of arbitrating, and I put together written guides um, that I provide to parties about what the experience using technology is going to be like. Um, and I often now find myself having pre-hearing or pre-mediation conferences for the purpose of testing the technology and talking about how we're gonna navigate through you know, that additional layer um, in the dynamic. And those opportunities I've always found to be really valuable in that I get information, I get a better sense of the case, um, but it's critically important, I think, that when I'm doing that, when I'm taking on the role of teaching parties about how to participate distantly, remotely, that I'm extremely competent. Um, because just as, you know, if I were to drop the ball in managing any other aspect of the mediation process, parties can very quickly lose confidence in the, in the process in general. Um, and so, you know, I think there are choices to be made from practitioner to practitioner about how comfortable each of us is with whatever platform we're using, um, you know, and that that decision is an important one. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I'll just say a few more words. Um, there's no absolutes here. So it right. isn't like in every, in every instance, all the time, you have to have a, 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 a separate person introducing and explain the technology. But I do believe there's something different about that, that, that when we're talking about introducing people to technology, there is a a fear and a tension and a desperation that is different. And they're looking for something to cling to and because um, they don't have any idea what's going on. And this is, a, this is a whole new world and it's very terrifying. And I think that possibility of clinging to the, to the explainer neutral as the lifeline is, is, a, is a real possibility. Um, whether that can be overcome, well, maybe it can. And I kind of like the idea of doing a written guide because in a way that separates you personally a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's now the, you know, it's an objective, it's an objective tool where somebody's learning about it, but it's not you communicating the, the exact, exact same way you will during the mediation session. So, so if you want to do it yourself, I, I do like that idea of providing some written materials rather than the face-to-face the -face. Um, again, because my fear is that people are going to, uh, you know, out of desperation, just start clinging on. Okay, Thanks, great. David. We've got about five minutes, and Tom, it looks like the yep, chat box is filling are, up. Yep, some questions are coming in. The first question is regarding uh, gaps in technology that might create power, power imbalances, and how can we restore balance between the parties? Would uh, uh, either uh, any of the three um, panelists like to address that? Well, I think, you know, the neutral has some responsibility here to, to think about that. And when you're selecting the technologies that you're going to use, you want to select technologies where 
um, there's some effort to try and compensate for that. Um, you, you know, people have limited bandwidth. Um, you know, maybe they can't. Maybe they can only access on mobile phones. Um, whatever you're going to want to do is going to have to be functional on a mobile phone as opposed to a full desktop because people may not have it. So I, I do think that some of that responsibility goes with the neutral because you can decide what you want to use and you should pay attention to whether or not that technology, there are things inherent in that technology that are going to either create or exacerbate um, some, some inequities and imbalances. I, I think that's a really wonderful question. And um, I, I actually like Danielle's approach is, you know, come and, and sort of two parts. First is start, as Danielle says, with pre-meetings to educate the group about um, what does it mean to be doing this work using a technology platform? How is it gonna look and feel? Um, and then of course, as the neutral or as the mediator, um, you're gonna want to uh, check back in with your parties, check back in with yourself to uh, make sure that you think that the playing field is still level and or if there are uh, irregularities or imbalances, uh, is the technology the source of it? I think is the crucial question to ask. Great, Great. there was a, there was another question about, and Josh, if you would, wouldn't mind addressing this, is a little bit about uh, detail about what you're doing with Native American communities uh, in terms of the FMCS involvement. Yeah, that, that's an easy one. I'm, I'm so glad um, whomever asked that question. It's usually uh, nationwide in impact when federal mediation is called, is requested, and it's um, federal tribal negotiations at the highest level. In other words, negotiations that will impact all 574 federally recognized tribes and or uh, regional in impact. It might, you know, it might affect 20 or, or 100 tribes, you know, depending on the part of the country and how concentrated they are in that area. So uh, we, we have our small role in um, assisting uh, what we call um, and what they call in Indian country, the government to government relationship, the sovereign government to sovereign government. And so federal departments and tribal leaders will engage federal mediation uh, as the facilitators, mediators, impartial helpers for some of these large scale negotiations. The most recent one was the Tribal Transportation Self-Governance Program, which was nearly two years of mediation process. That's, that was after two and a half years of negotiations that failed without bringing in federal mediators. And a good portion of the work once federal mediation got involved was done using a platform exactly like this one. And the reason was to save on, on travel time and expense we would do work over Zoom type platforms in preparation for these very large plenary meetings with kind of big tables, lots of negotiators, tribal and federal members of the public sitting in back because uh, they're invited as well at this uh, kind of negotiated rulemaking level. I hope that's Thanks. answered the question. I would be more than happy during the breakout sessions to uh, talk further about that. Yeah, Jan, I just want to check in with you. I'm showing a couple minutes. Before yeah, I think that's end. that's a wrap. So okay. I appreciate the questions. And Josh, thanks for reminding us that um, the panelists have agreed to stay on for an additional 15 minutes. And we've got breakout rooms set up that you'll be able to just move yourselves into. Uh, they're going to be in three separate rooms, but you can rove around and they may end up roving around. But I think they're going to try, you know, try and be in separate rooms just to have smaller group conversation. So let me let me wrap us up by thanking the panel. Uh, tremendous discussion today. Um, and I wanna make a few remarks because there are other people to thank. Uh, Lyra, of course, is the big one. Um, and so we do invite you, all of you to join Lyra as a, as a member. Um, if you haven't already done so, it's a wonderful professional community and you get to join the dispute resolution intersection um, for free as part of that membership. And so um, the folks to thank, I didn't mention Dick Fincher and Mark Goff at the beginning of the program, but they're the chair of this series um, and we're really the, the, the architects of this opportunity. And so we, we thank them for their work and effort. Um, publicity Chair Sabrina Dunsworth, actually of my agency, the Oregon ERB, um, was helpful in getting the word out to so many people. Our, our attendance just was off the charts. Um, our sponsors, of course, the National Academy of Arbitrators, the uh, AAA, ACR, and a number of institutes of higher, higher ed uh, were involved in sponsoring and supporting this. And then again, 
of course, Emily uh, Smith, our executive director of Lyra, and Bernadette Timon, a uh, membership and marketing coordinator. None of this would be possible without you. So, and thanks to the audience for coming out, making it possible. And we hope you'll stick around for part two of mediation, uh, future of mediation, where we're going to talk about process design. And we've got an amazing pan another amazing panel. So, Josh, Danielle, Dave, again, thanks again, and everybody, and see you in breakout rooms if you choose to do that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. And Janet, are we being assigned to breakout rooms? Or... Yeah, so let's just okay. see. Um, speaking of trying to educate people about technology. So I just uh, opened them all, and hopefully okay. you are seeing an option to join them and get to choose. This is the first time we've done it this way, so we're hoping it works. Right. All right. And scroll I down to the enjoy. bottom. There you go. Boy, everyone's jumping into FMCS. That's great. Here we go. I will hang out here, Janet, in case you need anything. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to stay here, Janet, in the in this room, or how? Uh, to you, I mean, um, I'm gonna just step away from the computer for a bit, but um, I think they're on their own there and. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I guess the, the breakout rooms won't be able to see the questions that are in this, this chat, will they? No. Okay, all right. And then I think the next panel um, should be arriving.